In the beginning, there must be an annoying legal disclaimer. All views expressed are our own and do not represent the opinions of any employers, organisations or clients for whom we work. Any recommendations or advice given in this podcast may or may not be right for you depending on your circumstances. Please bear this in mind before taking any action. Charting Tracks is brought to you by Amir Yacoub, Chris O'Gorman and Ben Hennessy Garside. Amir is a record producer, Grammy Award winning engineer, a co-owner of Bison Productions Recording Studios in East London and the director of Garnish Music Production School in London. Chris is a digital marketing strategist and digital manager. He's worked previously for Sony Music and was the head of digital at Capital Records UK. He currently runs a digital marketing agency and develops music artists working on brand development and marketing strategy. Ben is a singing coach. I am Ben. Uh, I'm a multi-instrumentalist, composer and producer. In the past, I've worked in music instrument retail as a record label scout, a live sound engineer, and I'm currently a lecturer at Leeds Conservatoire, teaching voice to popular music students alongside being a dad and a husband. This is the third episode of Charting Tracks and is the second of three in which we discuss ways to support people in their progression as music practitioners. Do enjoy it. I wanted to talk about uh, The Mesh. This is a thing that I call the mesh, right? And it's it comes from um, it's a cognitive um, education thing, and it's probably the perhaps the best way to to explain it would be for me to I'll, I'll try and frame it within um, within an actual musical problem, right? Okay, so and the problem is you want to come to understand the A major scale, uh huh, right? Um, I want you to think about that word understand. To be standing on something solid, right? Now, there are a number of things that you can do in order to understand the A major scale, Mm -hmm. right? One might be to listen to a recording of the A major scale. Another might be to learn to play it on your instrument. Another one might be to learn to sing it. Another one might be to write it out in musical score from bottom to top another one might be to compare it and contrast it to a c major scale another one might be to compare it and contrast it to an a minor scale all of these different things if you think about them like they're nodes on a network right there's a there's a sense of a kind of um mesh linking all these things together and it's it's the a majorness of the thing that you're trying to understand that's the thing that's linking them all together but if you imagine there's a, like a a load of strings all these all these little concepts um are kind of if you imagine they're um sticky notes um post-it notes and you've stuck them all on the wall you've written each of these things and you've stuck them all on the wall and then you've drawn a straight line between all of them and they're all crisscrossing over the top of each other they're creating this sense of a mesh Mm. Right. And then if you imagine that each of those lines, they're all ropes and you're standing on, on those ropes. Right. The more ways that you or the more actions that you take that are based in and around the A major scale, the more you're going to be able to claim that you understand it. Because there's loads of different ways of experiencing the A major scale. Mm-hmm. Right. You might play it. You might hear it. You might write a song in it. You might work out what all the different chords are that sit within that scale. You might play all the the individual notes out. You might write a bass line in it. You might write a a chord part. There are loads of different, almost like you can wear different glasses and look at the A major scale Mm. with different lenses on. Mm. Yeah. Um, Each each pair of glasses with a slightly different color shade is going to change the way that the A major scale looks to you. If you're wanting to come to understand any particular topic in in any sphere, to be honest, um, but also but also w- within the musical sphere, being aware of this sense of a mesh is another way of um, thinking about solidifying your understanding. Just to touch back on something we we talked about earlier, which is this kind of getting up and physically writing things down and using using the body and, and being kinesthetic. That's a way of understanding, right? There are. Multiple ways of multiple ways of knowing, and I, I got this from a from a cognitive scientist called John Vivaki. Um, there are multiple ways of knowing, right? Um, one way is to know something like physically, like on a. I mean, this is one of the things about um, about learning to play learning to play music. Actually, is you're exciting often. You're using multiple modes of learning simultaneously. Mm. So if you're reading sheet music, you're using your eyes to see the sheet music you're also physically moving your hands 
in a way that matches what you're seeing. Mm. And you're also auditorily hearing the things that you're, that you're doing, right? So you've got this like simultaneously three or four different ways of viewing the thing that you're playing. Or, and I'm using the word viewing in its widest possible way, yeah? So you're, you're physically feeling it, you're seeing it, you're hearing it. Using different senses is a way of building a mesh. And sometimes using senses simultaneously is different from using one at a time. Mm-hmm. And it's valuable to do things together and separately sometimes. Sometimes when I'm working with, um, with a singer, say, they can't actually sing an A major scale. For example, if we're working on scales, yeah. and, and, and which is one of the things that we do, they can't just sing an A major scale straight away. They will need to hear it by itself, perhaps, yeah. first, mm. right? Or if they're a reader, they'll be able to see it. Right. Or they need to hear the, the, the A first, and then go, okay, right, I've got the A now, I can... Got the A, and then yeah. and maybe they don't. They need to not hear the whole thing. Maybe they just need yeah. to hear the first three steps. Yeah. yeah. So there's also something about taking each little node on this mesh and doing it one after the other too. Sometimes you can you can overload yourself with too many different things, and so unpicking it and it's almost kind of like really solidly finding an area. It can also be useful. Hmm. So again, like I did before with Plan Doom Review, it'd be interesting to hear if is there anything like that in your in your development as a practitioner? Have you had any yeah. anything like that come up where perhaps you don't quite get a thing, but finding different ways of viewing that thing has helped you learn the whole. So based on what you're saying, uh, the closest that I've been to that, I guess, would be um, when I started learning music production and thinking about it, I guess. um, One of the things that I guess I found was a bit of a gap that was there was how do you make something sound like a record, right? So... I might have been sitting there and I might have been pulling sounds from here, there and everywhere, recording sounds, all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, particularly in my early development, did I really understand how a microphone worked and how to get the best out of a microphone? I would say no, um, obviously. Um, Did I understand how I could take a sound and maybe use a process like compression or EQ to make that sound... A, how I want it to sound, B, sound like a record, and C, just make it sound the best that it can, Um, and I would say no. Um, So even though I could put stuff together in terms of production and I was really good, um, things sounded, yeah, overall really good and, you know, all of that, it didn't sound like a record. And I feel like learning the parts of the uh, process that I needed to, which were things like mixing and, you know, how to engineer properly, record properly, things like, you know, the fundamentals like EQing and compression and all of that, learning those almost so well, actually so well so that I can teach them, um, but learning those to a point where I felt like I understood them enough to yeah, maybe teach, but also even when I'm alone in my studio, go, uh, I've taken the sound and I've made it sound so beautiful with this EQ or or ugly, if that's what I'm going for, <laughs> obviously. Um, but it sounds now right for where it needs to be. And in that's in the record, in the genre, because of what the artist told me or just for what I want to achieve as a producer. Um, So it's like those kind of things, I knew they were important. Let's just put it this way. I knew they were important. I just didn't understand them. Um, And I tried to learn them all together because that's what we do. Um, In no, I'm not knocking my education here, but, you know, in education, you have to learn everything together Um, and you have to put it all together. And we had individual sessions on this, that and the next, but... Had I sat and explored those things myself, individually, no. 
And I think when I started to sit and explore those things individually, it made the the network a lot stronger um, because I was looking at those little nodes, like mm. you say. Uh, so that's yeah. my experience. I, I just want to add in here, um, I'm not, by the way, knocking uh, like multi, multi uh, multitasking educationally either like that's a way mm. yeah and but so is looking at each node and and doing both is is probably the best stepping into the hole and then coming out and looking at each individual section if that makes you know as as a as a metaphor for it all uh, wh- yeah. what about you chris anything coming i mean actually the thing for me is when you said mesh network is but essentially that the entire music industry is a mesh network really because so and it depends on uh, you know it's a network of lots of different people slash companies slash agendas you know and often conflicting agendas as well um and you can view it because i'm just seeing it in my head now you can view it a different way depending on what you know where you come from so i've worked from sometimes from the artist perspective sometimes from the label perspective sometimes from the management sometimes from um you know working for the tour promote which has a whole different agenda as well and it's it's actually it's like this big net mesh network where the view changes so you can have be uh, have an artist part of it is you could zoom into the artist and the artist is the center of that mesh ne- network and then there's a, a line that comes off and goes to the manager and the manager's a node and then there's lines that come off from the manager to the tour agent to the l- promoter to um the photographer that they're going to book to do their photo shoot uh, then another line that comes off the artist to the label and then the label has a line off and the label's a node and then there's a line off to the radio plugger to the streaming plugger to the um PR person to the um, club promo person, you know, so there's no, or you can zoom off and then actually make the label the center of the mesh network. And then there's lines that come off to lots of different artists and each one of those artists is a node. And then there's another line off to their manager and to their people. Um, So it's funny, like the idea of mesh network is very much how I view, it's very much how the music industry is connected. Um, and set up as a, as a mesh network with lots of different nodes on that network, often working towards a goal, but also having separate agendas at the same time and separate um, objectives. Mm. Um, for me, that was experiencing the sort of industry through that way. Actually, it's a good it's a good visualization of what the industry is actually, and and how all those things sort of intersect. I think it's a really good visualization tool, actually, for for exactly how the industry works and what different people's agendas are. And actually, if that's made available for for artists, so they can understand that, hey, in your world, you're I'm the artist, I'm the center of everything here, and it's uh, yeah, okay, we'll view that from a label perspective, and then you're just one of many artists that's attached yeah. to, and it's um, probably a helpful way so that they can step into okay, I see it this way, but my you know my my label product manager is probably going to see it this way and they're coming at it from this angle and the radio plug is coming at it from this angle and it really will, probably will help the process feel a lot less painful. And a lot, you know, when you know what other people on the team or in the, in the network, what their agendas are and why they're doing it, and sometimes they're going to combine with your agendas, sometimes they're going to slightly pull away, but that, you know you can kind of then go, okay, well, I can make my peace with that because I know that that's going to help me in the long run in, you know, the overarching objective. Just knowing that that's how that network works, I think is probably a a really helpful tool to have. Yeah. So that that's a, an example of a, of a node is, is a, yeah. like a, I suppose you're describing like a set of priorities, aren't you? Yeah. Like for an individual. So, um, and uh and and it's and it's so that's it's helped you kind of understand the music industry and also and navigate, navigate it. it yeah mm. it's like a map yeah. because it's like right i know they're going to want this and this and this that's kind of going to bump up against what i need because what i need is this so how, and it just no, just knowing that knowing what those different um competing objectives are just allows you to navigate it a bit more easily sure yeah and, and make tra- and make trade-offs where you have to because right yeah or, or, fi- or find ways of making of 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 devising um win-wins yeah so yeah, you exactly. know you might be able to to know that 
okay, so I want to get I want to get on the, on the live agents books, and um, I know what they're going to want, and it's not a hundred percent what I do, but. Maybe there's yeah. maybe there's a couple of changes I'd be willing to make yeah. to make the deal a little sweeter for them because in coming to understand who a yeah. live agent is and what what their goals are, I'm able to see see a um, yeah a, a difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That might be as simple as just like an artist like oh I don't normally do an acoustic set but I know that if I have one ready to go. Mm. there'll be like when it comes to getting me in to do a, a really short support acu- acoustic slot, they'll have they they increase the amount of times they can book me because they don't need a full band. They don't need a full lineup or I can do go and do promo a lot more easily for my radio plugger. They can send me off on a little regional re- regional radio tour. Uh, I don't have to organize a full band. I can just show up with my acoustic set, a slightly different version than what I would normally do. It's not really how I want the songs to sound. It's not really how, you know the but it's but i can make it work for that um for for their objective and then they can get me in a lot more radio stations they can get me in a lot more sort of support slots and it moves the whole thing forward yeah mm. and, and one thing i would add to that as well is if, if you've written a song and you can perform it as an acoustic or in an acoustic version and you know, maybe you can produce a remix of it, and maybe you can, pre- and then you can perform it in the way that you would ordinarily want it. You're going to come to understand your own material more deeply. Mm. Yeah, you're going to be able to go to, to to different places. Maybe you could incorporate some of that acoustic stuff in your jet normal live set because in the act yeah. of r- rearranging it, um, you're going to be viewing your own work through a different frame. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, and there are loads of these little little things intersecting, right? So, because if, for example, you take the the learning the A major scale, well, you might choose to learn the A major scale on guitar. Not only is that good for you understanding the A major scale as a concept, it's also useful for you understanding how the guitar works mm. as a concept. Mm, yeah, yeah, coming to understand yeah. the guitar, learn lots of different scales. One of which is the A major scale. Um, so that you get a lot of these little kind of intersecting points. And again, the only reason why I'm describing this is just like run your life, do your thing, make your music, practice, just do what you do until you bump into a problem. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. at that point, standing back and thinking, okay, so what are the no what are possible nodes around this around this concept, this whatever it is? What what possible actions can I take that are gonna mean that I learn that thing that I want to learn? Mm. Or I can come to be able to do the thing that I, I couldn't previously do, and so again, it's just another little way of visualizing your own um, learning experience. Yeah. Um, in order to overcome a problem, it's it's a very cool concept actually. And um, if I'm honest, uh, I had no idea about it before. <laughs> yeah. Before our preliminary <laughs> conversations, um, but also I. I didn't have an idea about it. And I really liked um, what you were saying, Chris, as well, when it comes to thinking about it very visually. Obviously, I am a Mm. visual person. And, you know, um, I, again, going back to what Ben was saying, you know, A major, A minor, whatever we said, I can't remember. But looking through it, do different lenses um, with Mm. different glasses on. If you look at a map, Um, in the way that you described it, Chris, and you go in and you focus and you zoom in on what is a label, Mm -hmm. um, all of the arms that come off that, A&R, product manager, blah, 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 blah. um, And you look at it like literally zooming in on that map at that point, you'll be able to see um, what their perspective is and what they're trying to achieve, what their agenda is um, a lot better then obviously looking at the whole thing is quite confusing. Um, uh, uh, but kind of going, zooming and looking at those things and yeah. looking through those sets of glasses, you know, where we zoom on that network map is a pretty cool concept, actually. And one we should um, turn into a visual form, I guess. Yeah. That would be pretty um, cool. I think, it, I think it's a really useful potential aid. Yeah, but just on coming to learn about the music industry, though, mm. and this is the other thing: the act of physically drawing out 
that yeah. for yourself. I mean, either either in, like in the box on a computer or yeah. physically drawing it out, mm. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Most people are like, why? Should I, what's the point in that? Why should I physically draw it out? <laughs> I can just go on the internet and probably find one. There'll be one. There'll be one on the internet, like a, a map, a loose map oh, yeah. of the music industry somewhere, probably. There'll be some um, kind of flow chart. Type, like a, something yeah. like that, right? And but looking that, at that thing is going to yeah. be useful to you. But you're sure. not going to learn that as deeply yeah. as if you don't is it do it yourself. It? Yeah. And, and this is the thing with, with music theory that I really, really encourage my yeah. students to be doing. Because, sure, you can go and get an image of the, um, I don't know, say the cycle of fifths, right? Mm. But And you can just keep looking at it every day. Right, but all you're really doing is like you're stacking, stacking up, and stacking up, and stacking up on that one specific node. Yeah. The act of turning it into a physical exercise, drawing the circle, writing on the mm -hmm. parts, you're adding another node in in the kind of educational mesh, and that's gonna you're gonna find that you're able to understand the cycle of fifths more deeply. Yeah, I, I absolutely yeah. agree, and um, this is where, where we come back to talk about analog, right? So when I need to personally do some work, which is development work, I actually will not use a computer to do it. Mm. So I might be, um, for instance, trying to uh, make some sort of extra 1% in maybe the way that I treat sounds or something something that I feel that I need to learn a bit better. There's a weakness in my SWOT analysis. Um, I'll sit down with a pen and paper and I will watch that video and or listen to a podcast or whatever I'm doing and I will physically take notes. And uh, you know what? I might not do anything. I might not even reach back for those notes at any point. Mm -hmm. But because I've physically taken those notes, it's embedded in me a yeah. lot better than if I just tapped it yeah. into a, a there, I think there is whatever. some science behind that, isn't there? Uh, there's some psychology behind that in the... the motor function that your brain needs to make happen in order to, mm. to physically write something down to physically form the letters with a pen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. creates a pathway in the brain that then remembers the the actual content right. of that yeah uh, easier than it does if you're just typing or if you're just tapping on a on absolutely a we're, we're embodied creatures yeah right we, we 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 think that we live in like little kind yeah. of we have a little picture on a, you know, whatever yeah. social media network yeah. it is that we love. That's what we are. And we like text and this little picture, some, some, some pictures that we've taken and then treated, yeah. you know, we've put filters on and all sorts. We think that's us, right? More and more we're disappearing in this little yeah. kind of imaginary disembodied world, but it's not true. Like we're real. We're here. Like, yeah. Yeah. um, our nerve endings, our brain extends all the way down our brain stem and it extends yeah. out into our, into our physical arms. Yeah. Um, up until There's, the point when we can upload our psycho, uh, our, our consciousness uh, into, a, <laughs> into a database. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, but even that, right? Is <laughs> you, that's we're not going to be the same anymore. Yeah. Like we human beings are embodied creatures. It's it's, yeah. it's it's who we are, and it's 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 how we learn. Um, and that we we are also that little Facebook picture mm. or you yeah. know, whichever choose your social network. We are also that thing, but. There's this whole other world that we often forget about, um, and it will help us really. I mean, a it's more interesting, it's more fun. I mean, why would you only why would you only want to see the world through one tiny frame? You know, we can touch yeah. things as well as hear them, as well as you know, say them. Like, there are a stack of different um, different ways of learning stuff. And by the way, the and this is really really important as well. I really want to hammer this point home. Um, is the best way to learn something is to teach it to someone else. Oh, hundred percent, hundred. I know this is like this is the teacher's like dirty little secret. <laughs> this is their like, you know, as a as as a lecturer, it's like I learn way more from my students than they probably learn from me, <laughs> right? And my students learn a lot because I'm an amazing teacher, of course, of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah, in of every course. way, every imaginable <laughs> but, way. But in spite of that perfection. You know, in spite of that, um, I still will probably learn more from them than they will from me. And it, it's a thing that I would encourage all my students to do is teach someone something, hmm. right? You, 
you're a singer and you've made your way, you've been able to get into Leeds Conservatoire, so you've ended up as one of my students. You've got more than enough skills to work with work with some some in order to, to to get to the stage where you can pass the audition and you've you know you've got some background in music and you and you've got you in order to get onto that course, right? You've enough skills to teach your little brother or sister something musical or you know i don't know go and volunteer at a local local youth club and say i'll I'll do it for free for a bit i'll see how it goes you know if you like me being around maybe you can start paying me some money or set yourself up like undercut all the local teachers in your local area you know they're they're charging they're charging i mean around here uh because we're up north uh you know they're they're charging what like 30 an hour or something charge fifth charge 15 charge 750 for half an hour to teach i don't know a a a 12 year old how to, how to play some piano which is exactly what happened with me right like i mentioned last time there was an an it student who needed a little bit of extra money undercut all the local teachers yeah. taught me some music right his yeah, yeah. his his development as a pianist would have would have progressed would have pro- yeah absolutely and yeah. he and he's getting paid for paid for the privilege yeah. and it's really, really, very, very rewarding. Mm. There's a reason why, personally, why I'm an educ- I'm a music educator now, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. It's because I just love it. You know, go and teach, and it doesn't doesn't need to be amazing. Do it for free. Like teach your mates, like your non musical mates, if you've got any. Um, you probably find said- they they disappear as you, as you progress yeah. into your career. Right? <laughs> but. Um, thing is it makes you reassess things that you've long held you know ways of you seeing things or um opinions that you've held or pro you know techniques that you've long since for uh, that standard i guess when you then come to, to teach that someone else does it then sort of go ah actually is that the best way or is there another way or is it the best way for this specific uh person or this specific reason does it kind of make you question and then develop ideas even further mm. yeah yeah definitely yeah you could you, you have to in order to do it well and you'll as the again this is one of the things if you're planning doing reviewing if you're planning to teach teach then review on it yeah that's the other thing if, if you're a self self-reflexive teacher so uh you teach and then you have a little think afterwards about the ways that you could improve the session for next time if you do that you're more and more you're putting on a different pair of glasses because you're trying to look at the 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 issue through the other person's you know metaphorical eyes. Yeah, I mean, it, it might not be a visual thing that they're they're struggling with. It could be that they could you know say it's piano you're teaching and they can't quite get their finger in the right in the in the right in the right way. Well, you needing to put yourself in their shoes and and try and understand the problem from their position is going to really strengthen. You're going to you can create more nodes on your own net mesh, on your own educational mesh. I mean, Want yeah. Want to learn something? Yeah. Teach. Teach. I For like sure. that. <laughs> My experience has been similar to you, Ben, in the sense that I do teach and, you know, and mentor, which is a form of teaching, I guess, um, in amongst all of that. I think I've learned so much in, you know, obviously what I need to be better at personally, but also it kind of forces you to stay ahead a little bit as well. So someone comes to you to learn about something and you're using some method that is so old and and antiquated and they come to you and they go, oh yeah, but don't you do that like that now? And it's just like, well, maybe I should. Maybe maybe you are here to to tell me or to teach me um, that I'm thinking... And I'm too stuck in my ways um, and I need to change that. And there's also, um, this is one thing that we've said again in the past, Ben, um, if you can't teach it to a five-year-old, you don't know it yourself. So, you know, if it came to a certain thing, and obviously there's obviously (laughs) certain things you can't teach a five-year-old, but, you know, if there was a certain thing you can't teach someone who's younger than you at the very least or or maybe he's just less knowledgeable about this topic uh, than I am if I can't teach them 
if I can't teach it to them, the way that they, in a way that they understand, like really, really well, um, then obviously I don't understand it enough myself because I need to be able to come down to their level and and speak to them on their level, in their language kind of vibe. And that's why teaching, particularly in any way, shape or form, um, Chris, uh, you've spoken about also, you know, we've spoken about this before, Ben, um, yeah. doing masterclasses. That's a way of teaching. Don't go in there and spout, oh, I've done this, I've done that, or whatever, rather than actually teach someone, teach someone how to do something. Um, and you can do that in a masterclass, you can do it in private coaching sessions, you can do it in mentor sessions, whatever it is. You should be able to teach it to that person in a way yeah. um, to a point where they go away and they go, you know what, that makes total sense. I, I get and it's it. that absolutely, and it, like even, you know, when I was in House at Capitol Records or at Sony before that, the very first thing we would do if a new artist actually is some train a digital training session we kind of do media training and digital training the very first thing because you know it's traditionally media training would be the thing that they do early on to make sure to get a sense of who the artist is and kind of where where their pitfalls might be when they're speaking to the media and you know so that they don't uh cock up an interview yeah well yeah basically <laughs> so that they don't you know <laughs> say the wrong thing and or that they say the wrong thing in the right way mm. uh sometimes and that's the thing because <laughs> um but that's you know traditionally but but as the as the industry's become much more digitized um it's actually the first thing we do is because they've you know you you make sure that they're not going to say the wrong thing in front of a journalist or but actually they've got a journalist in their pocket the whole time they've got a smartphone that has that can get their message to yeah uh, you know to an audience immediately so the very first thing we do is actually kind of take them through the kind of a training uh you know do like digital training session with them mm. and you know a lot of these artists might not be coming from uh, you know they're coming from the, the point of view of an artist not somebody that's thinking about digital marketing not somebody that's thinking about the the the, the specifics of each social network but when you kind of sit down with them actually you have to make it seem you have to tell you know find a way to convey something that might be, you know, quite technical, but in a non-complicated way. Mm. And I think that's the thing. It's not taking something complicated and making it sound even more complicated or taking something simple and make it sound more complicated. That doesn't help anyone. Taking yeah. something that, you know, is a bit technical and, you know, could potentially be complicated, but finding a way to turn it into a easily understandable, digestible, more sort of knowledge is, um, that's the sort of skill. And I think doing that, and going through that process is, ma I found massively helpful for me because it's like, ah, this is the simple way of saying that, you know? Yeah. And also, and it must be quite empowering for them as well. Yeah. To walk away knowing that actually they, they really learned something to the point where they go, oh, actually, there was this big daunting thing that I thought was a big daunting thing. But in fact, the way that Chris has explained it to me, I can do it every day. It's like, it's just demystifying, you know, because there are industries that are built around making things seem more complicated than they well, are a lot of the time. Well, yeah, exactly. Actually, that's how they know, make their money. <laughs> that's the thing. It's demystifying this for, for people. And that's demystifying it for those artists at the start of their kind of, you know, at the start of their career has helped me de demystify stuff for myself, actually. Exactly. Yeah. I 100% agree with that. Absolutely. Teaching um, is good. Yeah, I, I just want to, um, I just want to add in a little caveat on that. It's like obviously, if you if you're working with like in in the voice world, if you're working with mm. with young people, you obviously need to be very careful of their 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 voice, their developments. Um, you know, there's going to be you, you may need to get some kind of insurance. You can get that from through the musicians' union um, currently. So j just, just make sure that you're kind of from a, like a professional point of view, if you are going to go ahead and do some of this stuff that you're covered in all the ways that you, that, that you need to be. Well done for yeah. that, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you know, what I wouldn't want is anyone listening to this to go away and, um, and get themselves in a, get themselves in a heap of trouble because they teach something that they can't teach or they mm. try to teach something that they can't teach. Um, to the wrong person and things go bad for whatever reason. Well done, Ben. <laughs>
Legal yeah. disclaimer. <laughs> here's yeah. some helpful links. <laughs> Brilliant. So generator functions. This is kind of taking any particular concept and kind of going one step. It depends how you want to think about it. But you could say one step deeper or you could say one step higher. Mm. Okay. I suppose that look at, looking at generator functions are... It's a way of expanding and extending the mesh, right? So these nodes are going to be, um, you're going to be creating more nodes because you're going to be viewing the same thing from it from a, from a different angle. It's kind of also the other thing as well. The more abstract that abstract that you go, like so, the further away from the the direct um, information, the more transferable it will be. It will it will become to different areas, and so. You can then start, and I know I'm, I'm describing this in quite an abstract way. It's probably needs a, it's probably going to need an explanation, like a, an example, in a minute. But w- what's what's going to be going on is, as you get more and more um, abstract, you're creating possible connections in your own understanding of of, of the world um, with other nodes in your mesh, right? From other 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 parts of your um, uh, your understanding. So let me give an example. You're a guitarist and you have a guitar lesson. And in the guitar lesson, they teach you all the notes in the A major scale. Well, there are some generator functions there. You might physically be able to play the notes on the guitar. All right. But a question to ask might be, well, what does that A mean? And then that's like a whole new little avenue of research and exploration for you. Because one of one of the generator functions that's kind of tied up and tangled up with the concept of an A major scale, mm. one of the things that creates that notion of an A major scale is the fact that it's, there's this thing called an A, the note A. Like, what's, what's that, right? How does that fit with all the other notes, mm. right? What are the other notes? Because sometimes people will learn these things and it, it is literally just a physical pattern. Obviously, my background as a piano player, that seems very strange because in piano, it's really clear that you can see the difference between mm. the sharps and flats and the white notes, the black notes and the white notes, right? But a guitarist, it's quite possible to learn a whole heap of things without ever asking that that question of, well, what's underneath that A major scale? You know, because you mm. can just see the shape on the fretboard. Yeah. Yeah. Asking, what's the generator function? What's the thing that creates that thing? The other piece, by the way, with the A major scale, of course, is well, there's this thing called a thing called a scale. Mm. What's that? What do we mean by a scale? And then that's another little avenue. You can do some research into that. I mean, in this day and age with the internet, right? Um, and, and by the way, a lot of this stuff probably feels quite obvious for lots of our listeners. But I'm, I'm using the the uh, A major scale as as a, as a simple example. Um, so yeah, so then so then you got the scale thing, right? Go off on your little research, find out what a scale is. Hmm. Um, how's a scale different from a chord? Why do we even need to think about scales? And right? how, so there's a whole whole heap yeah. of in answering that. What's the generator function of an A major scale? It's got these names, like what causes the thing to be named what it is. Next thing is the major scale. Oh, so once you know what scales are, you also know well there are different types of scale. Mm. What are all those different types of, what are different scales? So it's like embedded in the name of something, Hmm. there's a heap of, there's there's a number of these little generator functions. Like, so it's like a concept. It's a a concept that precedes, comes before the thing that you think you're studying. If you can get to those generator functions, then that you're going to, you're going to deepen your understanding of something. Knowing what they are can be hard sometimes. You might need to go back in that example. You might need to go back to your guitar teacher and say, oh, so like I've learned this shape and I've learned the note A. You're like, what What does that What does that mean? Why is that an A and, and not some other note? Um, or you might even say, uh, you might even ask the question, like what's underpinning this A major scale? Like, is there anything, how is it different from other things? Mm. Or you can research on the internet or, and this is the other thing as well, like other people know stuff. There's go to a local open mic night and play there and see if you can get speaking to some of the other musicians that are around, right? As a starting point. Yeah. Or hang around in studios 
Mm. Or do whatever you need to do to get to the point where you can ask people questions so they might provide you with the answer to this generate and function question. I mean, other people know all sorts of all, all sorts of things, and I think maybe we should cover that in a little bit, bit more depth. But um, I'm wondering if, if there's something that you guys um, could comment on as far as these generator functions are concerned. So I was, I was thinking maybe name a, name a, a, a concept or a procedure or, or something that comes from your sphere of expertise, and we'll see if we can hmm. pick out some generator functions just to kind of try and demo the, the process by which somebody so might... What's like, so what would be an example sort of just from your world of a generator function? Okay. Just like a scale, so you're... So, 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 so the scale, right? Mm. From a kind of like practical vocal mm. area, like a kind of a, an embodied vocal area, someone, you know, I, I might say, well, how do I, how do I extend my range? Mm. You know, maybe right. I want to extend my range. Well, what's the generator function of range, right? Right. And then and from there, I might then need to learn a little bit about the larynx. Yep. Right. Yep, 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 yep. And how that works. Yeah. 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 I might need to learn a little bit about support, airflow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so from my side, then, it would probably be something like along the lines of like when, you, when you're working with an artist, it's like, well, what's my brand identity or what's my artist identity? And what informs that is that how do you get to that? Um, where does it come from? Brand identity. So the generator function. Well, okay. What's a brand? Mm. Um, so it's, I, I suppose a brand is a, a, a collection of characteristics um, that, that resonate with people. Um, mm. I suppose it's it's you know when when people connect with a brand, they connect because there are characteristics of that brand that resonate with them, and they are characteristics of their personality. So I guess it's like the marrying of of uh, or like finding the the point where those characteristics connect hmm. and that's when you've got like a brand affinity i suppose okay and the the other word was uh, identity mm. so what do you mean by identity um uh, through, through you know looking at through the frame of of like a, a, a music artist it would be you know what is my um uh, what do i stand for what do i you know what's my archetype i suppose you you know you put it through that archetype um yeah, am I the rebel? Am I the uh, am I the jester? Like five, like five seconds of summer, for instance. Like at the start of it, okay, go, okay. Well, they're the jester. They're, you know, they're rambunctious and they're kind of uh, pranksters and kind of like yeah. they, you know. So we. Know I don't that, want to go too far into this because this is the next. Yeah, because we, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, but that's I suppose for me then it's like uh, yeah I suppose it's something I haven't really thought of that there's a generator function underneath that um you know that that's informing that that's informing that sort of concept i suppose or there's yeah. something underneath the brand and there's something underneath that and there's something underneath that and i yeah suppose... and you can go down a, a, a total rabbit yeah, hole because then you can start going into the psychology of why the artist wants to be that in the first place yeah that, and what's yeah. informing that what's driving that and then um, it, and then it becomes more and more about psychology and less and mm -hmm. less about and less and less about music and then it becomes more and more about biology and less and less right and yeah and, and yeah. you can go right the way down to kind of the way subatomic sub particles work right mm. and <laughs> you yeah. know yeah yeah but again it, 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 these are just ways of extending the mesh and it, you know trying to find a way of framing a good question to ask yourself mm. yeah what's the generator function mm. yeah um so what about you, Amir? Is there anything? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I would class as um, something that you can really kind of start to get into peeling back the layers of the onion, as it were, right, would be what we typically call an effects chain. So um, I'm there as a producer or as a mix engineer, um, whatever. Um and I'm working on a production of some description and I'm putting together an effects chain uh, for, let's say, an electric guitar. So you're now going to ask me what you're going to ask me. You're going to ask me what are effects and what's a chain. <laughs> so effects are, you know, the things that I'm putting on to make the guitar sound 
warmer or fatter or or more aggressive or whatever. Um, and what is a chain? A chain is a series of those. So essentially you go, okay, um, what effects are you putting on? So be specific. Um, I might put on a little bit of compression. I might put on a bit of EQ. I might choose to have some sort of distortion or saturation, um, all of that kind of situation. Um, I might do things like delays and reverbs and all of that kind of stuff, right? And then you're obviously going to say one level deeper, what is a compressor? And at that point, I say it controls dynamic range. It, what is dynamic range? Dynamic range is the difference between loud and quiet. Um, and that's about as far as we can go for now. Uh, then you move on to what is EQ? Well, EQ is equalization. It balances out frequencies. Um, if you want to take a frequencies and boost them up, um, you can make a guitar sound like it has more low end. Um, you can boost it up. Or if it sounds too harsh, you can remove some of the treble. Um, and obviously you can continue down that path, ad infinitum. Mm. So like, you know, for me... Um, having an understanding of EQ um, and compression um, or anything like that, there's all of the generator functions that we're constantly peeling back those levels. At one point, you're like, what is a frequency? Yep. Um, well, this is just a vibration of sound in air, essentially. Yep. <laughs> yep. And it's not even just sound because we can think of things like, I don't know, microwaves might work at certain frequencies um, and all of that kind of stuff. But it's how fast that sound cycles through one wave at a time. Uh, you can go, like you said, Ben, subatomic if you want to. Um, but yeah, yep. one example of, and a pretty chunky example like that, because you can get stuck into it with something like that, um, an effects chain is and can be um, on a guitar or vocals. I mean, vocal production itself is so huge and people are always like, oh, what did you use on your vocals? Like, what effects have you used on your chain? There's so many interesting things that people use on different instruments. And that's an example of a generator function in my arena. Right. So it's, it's good, like I said, for the mesh, but also in the creative world, it's also great, right? Because cause it can work the other way as well, right? Which is... You, you might have a process that you go through, which is in the studio, say you make the recording and you have the same, the compressor set to the same thing, maybe, maybe, maybe tape, right? It's, it's, I don't know, maybe it's like 1960 or something and you're compressing to tape to avoid tape hiss, right? Because yeah, real to real hiss, whatever. <laughs> and you have it always set at the same thing. In asking the question, well, what's a compressor? Then you, then, then someone goes, oh, well, that's, that's a processor, right? And then you can ask the question, well, what's a processor? And are there other types of processors? Well, yeah. <laughs> and and that, that then opens up a whole, and like you've talked about it, you've talked about, well, what happens if I add some distortion? Yeah, exactly. What happens if I if 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 I add some if I add some EQ? Well, what different types of EQ are there? Oh, well, there's this type of EQ and there's this type of EQ. And I've just added this type on because that's what I do. What do you mean that's what you do? Well, it's what the engineer that was in here before me told me that I need to do yep. with this yeah. equipment. So that's why I'm doing it. Yep. But in the act of asking the question, you can say, well, I'm going to try a different EQ. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, you know, where before, um, I would always, always stick a, a high pass on at 75 um, Hertz just to, to, to pull out all the bass frequencies. Right. Oh, I'm going to try sticking on a, I'm going to try sticking on a low pass. Yep. Oh, what does that do? Oh, it does this thing. Ah, it sounds a lot more kind of like muddy and it's like more woolly sounding. We've lost a lot of the top end. Let's keep it. Okay, great. So it's the other advantage of it is it opens up options. It like it creates other little other little avenues. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, Chris, with your brand identity thing, this notion of identity, right? What's the, what's the identity? Mm. Well, it, it it ironically it was me thinking about that generator function with identity that led me down this, well, it's like a, it's like a, a person has an identity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So psychologically then what's, what's that? Like it's a personality. Yeah. And then there's this whole, 
swathe of um, depth psychology, and, and then and then that led me on to Jung, mm. and all this stuff with the, the the archetypes. Like I'm not the first person to have done it at all. You know, yeah. Of course, this question has been asked by other people. What's the generator function of you know of this or that? And this thing about archetypes, which we'll get onto next time, arose f- exactly from this me asking this question of the frame brand identity. That's interesting because that probably le- yeah that leads quite in nicely in for next time I suppose then about what that yeah asking those questions unlocks. Sometimes it unlocks more questions, but then those questions, just the act of unlocking those questions can be a, a, a learning experience. And a, mm. um, for me, that can kind of then, I suppose, almost going down that, it's, it's like a bit of a rabbit hole, but when you go down it, it kind of actually, and when you do that work with an artist, it kind of helps you normally come back out of that rabbit hole and you sort of define who they are and they have a much more clear sense of, of of who they are and i think when it comes to marketing that's (laughs) pretty crucial that you have that Mm. a really definable whether it's persona brand identity you know archetype personality whatever it is uh, sort of different ways of saying a similar thing i think um but it's ultimately that's what's an audience is going to connect with and that's what sets apart the artists that kind of stand the test of time and people really buy into them with the ones that sort of, you know, might have a few hits and then don't necessarily, you know, stick around. I think that's the thing that that takes somebody from being a good songwriter, a good musician, a good performer to being an artist. And that's mm. the thing that I'm excited to talk a little bit more about. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> There's loads of ways in which which like the next one's just line, lining yeah. itself up. <laughs> so, Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening um if you can please subscribe like uh, tick um thumbs up um star do whatever you have to do um to show us some love uh, we'll show you some back um if you want to ask us some questions please go ahead all right thanks bye <laughs>